Join me on my mission to create a new tomorrow as I chat with industry experts, elite athletes, thought leaders, and government officials about how we activate our vision for a better world. We may agree and we may disagree, but I'm not backing down. I'm Ari Gronich, and this is Create a New Tomorrow Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of Create a New Tomorrow. I am your host, Ari Gronich, and today I have with me Dr. Debbie Silber. She is the founder of the Post-Betrayal Transformation Institute and is a holistic psychologist, a health mindset and personal development expert, and the author of number one best-selling book, The Unshakable Woman, Four Steps to Rebuilding Your Body. Dr. Debbie, let me uh, just ask you to talk to the audience, tell them a little bit about your background and why post-betrayal? That seems to be an odd thing to niche in, so... Yeah, I don't, I don't think anybody says, oh, I think I want to study betrayal. <laughs> no, uh, it's actually my 30th year in business. And uh, as life would morph and change, so would, so would the business. And I was in health and mindset and personal development and then uh, trauma. And I had uh, my first betrayal from my family and I thought I did the work to heal. And a few months, well, not a few months, a few years later, actually, it was my husband. And uh, anybody who's been through it, you're blindsided, you're shocked, you're devastated. You know, life as you've known it is no longer. So got him out of the house. And I, I, I thought about it. I said, okay, well, what's similar to these two experiences? And I realized I never really took my own needs seriously. It was about everybody else. Boundaries were getting crossed. I was like, something's got to change. And that's me. So um, four kids, six dogs and a thriving business. I was 50. I'm like, that's it. Going back for a PhD. I didn't even know where that idea came from. I didn't know how I was going to pay for it, how I was going to do it. Uh, but it was in transpersonal psychology, the psychology of transformation, the human potential. And um, while I was there, I did a study. I studied betrayal. What holds us back? What helps us heal? And what happens to us physically, mentally, and emotionally when the people closest to us lie, cheat, and deceive? That study led to three groundbreaking discoveries, which changed my, my health, my business, my family, my life. Very cool. So betrayal. Let me ask you a question. All of what you kind of said was betrayal from others. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about working on you, right? So the biggest question is the betrayal that we give to ourselves, yeah. right? So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Self-betrayal is huge. And there's such a link between self-betrayal and betrayal. You know, self-betrayal is when you know something isn't in your best interest and you do it anyway. You know something doesn't serve and you do it anyway. You know you shouldn't do something, or feel something, keep going back for something and you keep doing it. So we're betraying ourselves. You know, it's not in our best interest yet. Um, we keep doing it. So that's self-betrayal. Okay, so how does that extend into others betraying us? Because what I've found, at least in, in my experience, is the harder I treat myself, the harder I get treated by others, right? So it directly correlates to I'm expecting at this point people to betray me. And so I'm going to invite that in, so to speak, versus know when I have to have a barrier between myself and that or boundary. Yeah, you know, it, it, we write the script for how people treat us. And, and uh, but there were so many things in what you said, like what one thing is, if you expect it, for sure, that's what you know, that's what you'll have. And, and that's why we see so like, I could spot an unhealed betrayal from a mile away. And one way is when there's a repeat betrayal, because here's this uh, opportunity for us to learn something really profound. Not that we're causing the betrayal, but there's a real opportunity here. And until and unless we do, we will keep getting opportunities in the form of people to teach us this. You know, maybe the the bound, you know, the rule is, or the lesson is, I need better boundaries in place. I am lovable, worthy, deserving, whatever it is. And you know, it's time to get that lesson so it doesn't have to keep repeating itself. Gotcha. So <sighs> In the context of how we create a new tomorrow and activate our vision for a better world, mm -hmm. you know, what, what do you say is like the number one, number two, number three things for people to do so that they can understand this stuff and 
begin creating a new tomorrow today for themselves? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing is, uh, like I live real simply, it's a very simple rule. If it's gonna hurt someone, don't do it. <laughs> you know, I'm always shocked and amazed that other people just don't follow those same rules. So it's, it's, it's really simple. It's like, if you wanna make a better tomorrow, do do right by people you know lead with kindness lead with love like don't just don't hurt people period uh but that's not you know people are acting from their current level of consciousness from where they are that's the that's the choice they think is the best the best move so you know so what do we do of course the first thing is prevent something ha from happening in the in the first place that's best case scenario um second best is clean it up clean it up it, it for the betrayed person, there's tremendous opportunity for growth, but for the betrayer, there is too. That is, that could be the biggest wake up call of their life. You know, with some people, it's just on to the next. There's a void, there's a hole, there's a gap, and they just don't want to look, don't want to see. So they just keep looking for something on the outside to fill that inside need. You're really not working with much here. So when that's the case, you know, you heal yourself and, and rebuild like, with in my scenario, um, I learned rebuilding is always a choice whether you rebuild yourself and move on. And that's what I did with my family. Um, or if the situation lends itself and you're willing and you want to, you can rebuild something entirely new with the person who hurt you. And that's what I did with my husband. So not long ago, we married each other again. Um, and there's the opportunity, but, but I never in a bazillion years would have done anything like that if I wasn't totally different and for sure if he wasn't either. Interesting. So here's where I guess I'm struggling with, mm -hmm. with some of this is, is there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of self accountability, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's also this accountability to and for others. And so when you say something like, just don't hurt people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think to myself, well, I could be just doing me, being mm -hmm. a good person the way I'm a good person, and somebody may get hurt somehow, somewhere, right. in some way. And so how does <laughs> not hurt somebody and take care of your business internally and your internal pain so that you're not basically being a pain thrower, right? Throwing your right. pain off onto mm -hmm. other people. Yeah. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I want to get the balance here for yeah. the audience of this. It's a great question. Intentionality is really where it is. You know, that that's what I'm talking about. Um, when you intentionally are hurting someone, you know, of course, listen, if you, you accidentally bump into someone, you weren't trying to hurt them. It's just, it was an accident and things happen. Betrayal, the reason why betrayal is such a, a, a unique type of trauma is because of how intentional it is. When someone's breaking the spoken or unspoken rules of that relationship and every relationship has them, right? It's a breaking of those rules. One person was abiding by the rules and the other person without their awareness or consent broke the rules. That's where it's an issue. If, if both people in a relationship, whether it's friends, family member, partner, whatever, if it's an understood thing, hey, there are no rules here. Okay. And if that's your rule, that's okay. But when there's an understanding, spoken or unspoken, you know, and when one person chooses to break that um, and breach that trust, that's what I'm talking about. Gotcha. Okay. So then let's talk about businesses betraying, you know, people, right? So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, because as I sit and look at politics and look at businesses and look at all the things going on, religion, um, there's been a lot of betrayal of the trust that people have been placing in them. And so that's where my question to you would be, Let's talk about the larger betrayals beyond individual to individual, the, mm -hmm. you know, community to individual, country to individual, religion, authority figure, whatever it is. Yeah, um, you broke up for a big piece of that. So I, I'm going to try to imagine what you were saying here. Okay. Uh, 
It's so widespread. It really is. I mean, even some, you know, I remember in my research reading about uh, consumer betrayal. I mean, we can be, think about it. You can, uh, and, and the study even found there was something called the love versus hate principle, something like that, where we would rather knowingly do something we know is bad for, buy something we know is bad for us than be duped. For example, you know, cigarettes, we know it's bad for us, right? But if someone were to purchase cigarettes, they would rather do that than buy a product that says, let's say it's good for us and it's not, right? So, and then because quickly that love for that company turns to hate, we are furious. Um, it's that feeling of being duped. And yeah, so much, you know, we're, we're feeling it in so many areas of life right now, just even in this post COVID uh, world we're living in. And, um, you know, where some people are just feeling there, th we could feel betrayed by our own bodies. We could feel betrayed by life, by government, by, by God. I mean, people can universe source, whatever you say. So it's, it's really, um, you know, even a breaking of those expectations, right? But the, the way it works with, with betrayal is the more we trust and the more we depend on someone, the deeper the betrayal. So a child, let's say, who's completely dependent on their parent, the parent does something awful, it's gonna have a different impact than your you know, best friend sharing your secret. So then what is the, the mechanism, right? I talk about this a lot on the show, the mechanism that causes people to act against their own self-interest because I look at, at what's going on just in general, the news, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's probably a high percentage of the population that feels betrayed by the news, that feels like everything is being lied about. Like we go down the aisle in the grocery store, we see all natural, healthy, and then you look at the ingredients and there's almost nothing natural or healthy about it, right? So how does somebody, number one, emotionally deal with the fact that they are constantly being lied to, betrayed, and treated in a way that's, you know, against their own self-interest. Mm -hmm. So how, the emotional side of that, but then how do we get people to act based on that so that we can stop those trends? Yeah, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great question because if anything makes you angry, it's, it's that you're being lied to. And, and you you know and that's where trust gets shattered because then we can, then we look at it like with the, the the closer the more obvious betrayals we say I can't trust my betrayer I don't even trust myself how did I not see how did I not know so how do I then trust this person that person so trust is completely and totally shattered and that's why uh, it, it's so traumatic we you know we have to be discerning and we, you, so what we don't want to do is just be um, so unwilling to trust because if there's no trust, there's no relationship. There's no, there's no intimacy. There's no closeness. You're living half a life, right? It's like you're getting burned on the stove and you're like, that's it. I'm never cooking again, right? Yeah, that's not fair to you. So we need to have some level of understanding that people are acting from their current level of consciousness. This is the best they can do for right now. Now, how do you change it? You act like the role model. You do you, you do you the best way you can. And um, you know, people ask me all the time you know, when it comes to, let's say, kids, uh, you know, they're watching everything you do way more than what you say. It's what you do. So just do the right thing as best you can from where you are right now. Okay. <clears throat> so that, that, that's a partial answer. So that's the emotional side, right? Mm -hmm. The active mm -hmm. side. To activate yourself to stop that behavior from not just affecting you, but when we see it, I mm -hmm. consider that to be the bully, right? So the behavior is, it's a bullyish behavior. So I always say silence is a bully's best friend. So if you want to mm -hmm. stop the bully, you got to get loud, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, how does somebody get loud, start being noisy about the fact that, hey, this is going on, Mm -hmm. And yet doing it not in a victim way, but doing it in a, let's empower ourselves and the rest right. of the community to say, hey, we should probably not do this. Right. You know? So, I mean, I don't think really you accomplish anything from a victim standpoint, except making yourself sick. I mean, that's really all you do. Um, from a, a place of strength, it's, it's having boundaries in place and, and standing firm 
with them, not being flimsy with your own boundaries. And, and the easiest way to see this is what would I recommend to someone else? If I'm, if I'm, if I would say, if someone were to come to me and say, what do I do about this? Or should I tolerate this or that or the other thing? You know, what am I doing? If, and here's the thing when it comes to betrayal too. If I would be completely and unwill, you know, completely unwilling to accept anything less than what I deserved, let's say from that person who betrayed me, well, I have to be completely willing to show up in that strong, powerful way myself. So I have to be unwilling to accept anything less of myself. So I, I can't just, you know, anything goes. No, I'm holding myself to a higher standard. If I'm going to hold someone else to it, I, I start first. Right. I understand that. So I don't want to go bigger with it again. Uh, you know, my, my, my whole thing, I want to go bigger with all yeah. of bigger and deeper, bigger and deeper. So yeah. again, I'm going to go, this is cool. And let's talk. Cancer is a betrayal, mm -hmm. right? It's a betrayal. The betrayer mm -hmm. is let's say in some case, the cigarette company, right? Mm -hmm. The cigarette company right is lying to you for 50 years, telling you that it's yeah. good, right? And now, and now it's done, right? Now, now right. we know. Right. So, so now you're, you've become the betrayer yourself because now you have an open relationship with what used to be the betrayer, which is the company, right? Right. So now my, my role is to not spend a penny with that company again. Because if I do that, and the next person does that, and the next person does that, and the next person does that, we're not supporting something that isn't in our best interest. Okay, so how do we develop the chain reaction? If we see something that's systemically bad, not for us, but for everyone, right? How do we stem that chain reaction? So I'm gonna go to a deeper thing. Cigarettes is like easy, right? We already mm -hmm. kind of have that around. Mm -hmm. But let, let's say pesticides in our food. Right. which cause cancer, which are very toxic to your nervous system, your immune system, all those things, right? Absolutely. So, so let's talk about that. How do we get, and not just you and me who have gone organic or mm -hmm. whoever who you know says, let's all go organic and let's hug trees, right? Mm -hmm. Which completely divides people. How do mm -hmm. we get that train going to the companies? that are providing those chemicals to stop the government yeah. that, you know, like, how do we stop people yeah. other than just saying, oh, I'm personally not going to do that because yeah. one uh, person's pennies don't mean as much as a hundred people's pennies. Absolutely. But, you know, it's like the, the, the only word that comes to mind is critical mass. If I do it, if you do it, and then if, if our message gets to the next per person, the next person, the next person, you know, that's, that to me is more effective. Listen, some people are activists and they're going to be the ones with the signs and, and, you know, protesting outside the company headquarters. And, and I, I get that. Um, I'm going to do my part in not supporting something and, and sharing the message to, let's say my community and doing my part. And if everybody does their part, it's, we can have that, that critical, that critical mess. It reminds me of that starfish story. You know, you hear the starfish, there are all these starfish on the laying on the beach. And there's the, I think it's a, like a, a grandchild, grandson and a grandfather and, or so, something, no, some, whatever. And they're just throwing one starfish in and one starfish in and they're like, well, what's the difference? There are so many thousands. It's like, well, this one, it made a difference to this one, made a difference to this one. So I, I look at it like we're in a beautiful, uh, we have a beautiful opportunity to do our part, share it with our community, be the role model and, and, and let that, let that grow. Got it. So I don't think yes. the anger is, is what, is what moves the angle. If the anger motivates, that's beautiful, but coming at it from a place of strength, not a place of just react reaction. Right. But I guess what, what I was hope what I, what I got from you, which I was looking for was the, the share, the oh, yeah. tell people, the get out and, you know, not just keep it within for you or yourself. Right. Well, but share it. Right. Well, it's of course. Like, I mean, that's why I opened up the PBT Institute. What's the point of me just healing? I mean, I made a vow. I said, if I, if I heal, I'm taking everybody with me, you know, why on earth would I just do this for just myself? It's like, I feel like we owe it to 
to others, if we've been through something, how do you not share that and shorten someone else's learning curve? And if everybody does that with their own experience, someone has a financial crisis, they teach how to avoid it. Someone has a health crisis, they teach how to avoid it. I had a betrayal crisis, I teach someone how to heal from it. I mean, I think that's, that's how we contribute. Awesome. So I like the anger. <laughs> The anger absolutely motivates me in, in some ways. Mm -hmm. And um, and I like action, right? I, I like the movement of yeah. action, which activism is that. Mm -hmm. And I'm and I'm like for my audience, you know, I'm such calling for activism these days. Yeah. For people to be actively not going against the system, but actively looking for ways that they can improve on the system. So Buckminster Fuller, one of my, you know, mentors, I guess, um, inspirations, I'd say, you know, used to say, you don't build something or you don't fight the system, you build something better next to it, and people will come. That's a yeah. paraphrase, but that's the idea. Mm -hmm. So what are we building, right, for people to come to that's better than the system that we've had? And yeah. so for you, you've created what you, you know, you call the PBT, right? The post betrayal Transformation Institute. There is nothing like it that exists. It's like how people know AA is if you have an alcohol issue. The PBT Institute is if you have a betrayal issue. You're not meant to stay there long. It's the training wheels until you don't need them. But there's a roadmap and a predictable way to heal now. So if we can't avoid it, next best is heal from it quickly. Awesome. So then I'm going to go into something I talked to you a little bit about in our pre-interview, which is the, the body, the somatics, the trauma mm -hmm. that lives inside of your cells. Mm -hmm. Because as at least in my years of experience, I don't really see talk so much or cognitive behavioral do very much for a person long term. It usually brings up the stuff more and, and you know, so... I talk a lot about somatics and body work and getting the issues out of the tissues. So mm -hmm. can we talk a little bit about that and how, how that relates to what you're talking about. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a huge component of healing. You know, the talk therapy, it, it can do one thing if you're unpacking it so that you do something with it, that's beautiful. But if you're just unpacking it, so you're just looking at it, I just don't see the the point of that. I mean, and here's the thing we found the wrong type of support does way more harm than good. Uh, because if someone isn't highly skilled, you know, we're talking about betrayal here, if they're not highly skilled and how to move someone through betrayal, it's, it can re-traumatize and just keep them re-traumatized because so many therapists actually blame the betrayer. Right. You know, let's say I, we've seen this so many times, husband and wife, goes to, she drags them to couples counseling. And if that therapist isn't highly skilled in, let's say, narcissism, let's just say, right? Narcissist is crocodile tears, very charming. And the therapist can look at the betrayed and say, you know, if you just learn to communicate better, it's like, are you joking? You know, so, so it's, that has a role, certainly if it's a qualified therapist, there's an important role there, but you're right. It's, it, it goes so much deeper. And, you know, that was one of the discoveries that there's this collection of symptoms so common to betrayal. It's known as post-betrayal syndrome. We've had about 25,000 people take the post-betrayal syndrome quiz. Um, I actually pulled some stats if you want me to share yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we have every age represented just about every country. And this is men and women. So this is so you see how, uh, how betrayal shows itself physically, mentally, and emotionally. Ready? 78% constantly revisit their experience. 81% feel a loss of personal power. 80% are hypervigilant. 94% deal with painful triggers. Those triggers can take you right down. Uh, these are the most common physical symptoms. 71% have low energy. 68% uh, have sleep issues, 63% uh, extreme fatigue. So you could sleep, you wake up, you're exhausted. Right. Those are your adrenals that have just crashed. 47% um, have weight changes. So in the beginning, maybe they can't hold food down. And then later on, they're using food for comfort. 45% have digestive issues. Anything from 
constipation, diarrhea, IBS, Crohn's, colitis, you name it. Um, the mental symptoms, 78% are overwhelmed, 70% walking around in a state of disbelief, 68% are unable to focus, 64% are in shock, 62% are unable to concentrate. So imagine here, you can't concentrate, you have a gut issue, you're exhausted, and you're supposed to work and raise your kids or whatever you're doing. That's not even the emotional ones. 88% extreme sadness, 83% are angry. Just mix sadness and anger and that's exhausting, right? 82% feel hurt, 80% have anxiety, 79% are stressed. Here's why I wrote the book, Trust Again. 84% have an inability to trust. 67% prevent themselves from forming deep relationships because they're afraid of being hurt again. 82% find it hard to move forward. 90% want to move forward, but they don't know how. Wow. Those are some pretty intense statistics. I'm actually very glad that you bring them up because, uh, you know, I'm a woo-woo scientist. I, I like the science. I like the research. I like, you know, the double blinds. I like that stuff. And I like the woo-woo at the same time. So I'm right with you. You know, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So let's break some of that down a little bit. It, sure. If you break down each, each one, like mm -hmm. what does that story tell you? Like just tell the story of what those numbers are. Yeah, the story is, and, and one thing I can share too was one of the other discoveries, the five stages that we go through from betrayal to breakthrough. But what it shows is someone can be um, fresh out of the shock of their experience or drowning in it, and it can be decades. It could have happened decades ago. And they think just because time has passed, they're better and they're okay and they're not. And, and it's interesting because in the quiz, there's a question that reads, is there anything else you'd like to share? And people write things like, my betrayal happened 35 years ago, I'm unwilling to trust again. My betrayal happened 40 years ago, I can still feel the hate. My betrayal happened 15 years ago, I feel gutted. So we know, you know, we've all heard time heals all wounds and I have the proof when it comes to betrayal, that's simply not true. So um, this is a representation of people who are stuck and struggling. So what do you, what do you, what would you consider percentage of the population that has betrayal? Because I would look at, at the world, right. Mm -hmm. And from birth to, to death, I don't see anybody getting out of life without several betrayals, mm -hmm. let alone, you know, major ones, but several major betrayals. Right. right. So, so what does that mean for a country, a populace? I mean, yeah. You know, it, it, it means we have, we have so many things that we do so well and so many things that we suck at, you know, <laughs> and, and where we really, it would really serve us to step up our game. Something like betrayal. I mean, you see the havoc that is left in the wake of a betrayal. So, you know, when that's what's left, after someone just breaks that unspoken or spoken rule, right? There's so much cleanup, there's so much heartache, there's so much damage, right? So, so it would really serve to just learn more about, like, I wish everybody knew these stats. I wish everybody knew. So this way the betrayer could be like, do I really wanna cause that, you know, these symptoms to, to my, the, the person I say I love, right? I mean, because it's, it's inevitable. Now, that's not saying you have to stay with these symptoms at all. You can heal from every single one of them. I did. But that's where you land. And that's where, you know, you can stay if you choose. Right. You know, staying stuck is a choice. Yeah. So what, what's, you know, talk about those five steps. Sure. Um, so, so, you know, even, can I give you a little analogy? I think this would really serve because I see this all the time with people where they, um, the ones who do get stuck, you know, I, I, here's the difference between resilience and transformation. Resilience is restoring and you need that for your every day. When it comes to betrayal, it's more like trauma and transformation. So using this analogy of a house, and I talk about this in, in my second TEDx, uh, do you have post-betrayal syndrome? So imagine the house needs a new uh, paint job and you paint, 
right? That's resilience. You're bringing it back, you're restoring it, or it needs a roof. You give it a new roof. That's restoring resilience. Here's trauma and transformation. A tornado comes by and levels your house, right? A paint job is not going to fix it. And a new roof's not going to fix it. Here's the thing though. You have every right to stand there at the lot where your house once stood and say, oh my gosh, this is the most awful thing that's ever happened. And you'd be right. And you can call over everybody you know and say, look at this. Isn't this the most terrible thing you've ever seen? And they'd all agree. And you don't have to do anything. However, if you choose to rebuild your house, you don't have to, but if you choose to, why on earth would you build the same one? There's nothing there, right? Mm -hmm. Why not make it so much better, so much more beautiful? That's the opportunity. Betrayal is the setup for transformation. Mm. And, and when we look at it like that, we could be like, okay, it's leveled. It's dead and gone. I can, at the very least, rebuild a strong, solid me. Uh, but who knows? A strong, solid new couple. You could do that too. Anyway, I wanted to share that before I got to the five stages. Yeah, no, I appreciate that because it, it brought something up in me, which is that rebuilding stage Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I've said as somebody who's had a brain tumor all my life, right, is I don't know who I would be without this tumor, w without the pain, without the struggle, without the angst, without the trauma, without the betrayal, without any of those things. Mm -hmm. I don't know who I would be. And then somebody gave me this uh, glass or this coffee mug that said, life is not about um, discovering yourself. It's about creating yourself or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I look at, or when you're talking about the rebuilding part, mm -hmm. decorating your house, the way you want it, building the rooms and the space, the way you want it, how does one even envision that from the place of betrayal from yeah. the place of of damage. Yeah. And in the very beginning, getting out of bed may be all they can do. So I, I'm just acknowledging that because that's that's real. Uh, and, and I'll walk you through the stages. And this way you'll you'll see exactly where someone is and 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 you'll know. And I invite everybody to to think about as I'm going through them, picture yourself if you're if you're there, if you were there, you know, where are you? Because uh, you'll see yourself clearly. The the first stage was uh, a setup stage. I saw this with every study participant, me too. If you imagine four legs of a table, the four legs being physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, what I saw with everybody was this real heavy lean on the physical and the mental and kind of ignoring the emotional and the spiritual. What does that look like? Looks like we're really good at thinking and doing, not really prioritizing the feeling and being, but that's where our intuition lies. So often we turn that down. But if there's a table with only two legs, easy for that table to topple over and that's us. That's not to say if you're busy thinking and doing, you're going to be betrayed. It's just that was what I saw. Stage two. This is by far the scariest of all of the stages. And this is shock, trauma, D-Day, discovery day. And this is the breakdown of the body, the mind, and the worldview. You're shocked. So you've just ignited the stress response. Now you're headed for every single stress-related symptom, illness, condition, disease. Your mind is in a complete state of chaos and overwhelm. This makes no sense. You cannot wrap your mind around what you just learned. It's like a weird time warp thing that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And your worldview is has just been shattered. That's your mental model. These are the rules. This is how life works. Don't trust that person. Go there, right? And every rule that governed life is no longer. It's terrifying. Bottom has bottomed out on you. But think about it. If the bottom were to bottom out on you, what would you do? You grab hold of anything you could to stay safe and stay alive. That's stage three. Survival instincts emerge. It's the most practical of all of the stages. If you can't help me, get out of my way. How do I survive this experience? Who can I trust? Where do I go? How do I feed my kids? Like it's that practical. Here's the trap. Once you've figured out how to survive, because it feels so much better than the shock and trauma of where you just came from, you're like, okay, all right, we, we got this. And you start planting roots here. We have no idea there's a stage four and stage five waiting. Transformation doesn't even start till stage four. But because you think this is it, you better figure out a way to make it work, a few things start happening. The first thing is you start getting those small self benefits, right? You get to be right. You get your story, 
you get someone to blame, you get a target for your anger, you get sympathy from everybody you tell your story to. You don't have to do the hard work of learning to trust again. Should I trust you? Should I trust you? Forget it. it's easier not to trust anybody. So you plant deep, deeper roots. Now that you're here longer than you should be, your mind starts doing things like, well, maybe you deserved it. Maybe you're not that great. Maybe this, maybe that. Deeper roots. Now, because like energy attracts like energy, you're calling circumstances and people and relationships towards you to confirm this is exactly where you belong. It gets worse, but I'll get you out of here. Because it feels so bad, but you have no idea there's anything better, right here is where you resign yourself to thinking, this stinks. I'm in so much pain. I don't know how to get out of it, but I better figure out a way to make it work. So right here is where you start using food, drugs, alcohol, work. TV, keeping busy, reckless behavior to numb, avoid, distract yourself from what's so painful to feel or face. So think about it. You do this for a day, a week, a month. Now it's a habit, a year, 10 years, 20 years. And I can see someone 20 years out and say that emotional eating you're doing or that numbing in front of the TV you're doing or that drinking you're doing. Do you think that has anything to do with your betrayal? And they would look at me like I'm crazy. They would say that happened 20 years ago. Doesn't matter. You see all they did was put themselves in a perpetual stage three holding pattern. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, if you're willing to let go of those small self benefits, you have to do a couple of things, grieve, you know, mourn the loss, do a bunch of things. You can move to stage four. Stage four is finding and adjusting to a new normal. Here's where you acknowledge, I can't undo my betrayal right? But I control what I do with it. So uh, I always use the example of if you've ever moved to a new house, office, condo, apartment, whatever, your stuff's not all there yet. It's not quite cozy yet, but it's going to be okay. When you're in that mental state, you start turning down the stress response. You're not healing just yet, but you just stopped the massive damage you were causing in, staging, in stages two and, and three. Also, uh, what I found so interesting to this stage is if you were to move, you don't take everything with you, right? You don't take the stuff that doesn't represent the version of you you want to be when you're in this new place. And what I found was if your friends weren't there for you, if you just had those like-minded stuck friends, right here is where you've outgrown them. And, and, I, and you don't take them with you. I saw that all the time. And when you're in this stage four, you're making it okay. You're making this your new mental home. You can move into the fifth most beautiful stage. And this is healing, rebirth, and a new worldview. The body starts to heal. Self-love, self-care, eating well, exercise. You didn't have the bandwidth for that earlier. Now you do. Uh, your mind, you're making new rules, new boundaries based on what you see so clearly now. And you have a new worldview based on the road you just traveled. Uh, and the four legs of the table, in the beginning, it was all about the physical and the mental. By this point, we're solidly grounded because we're focused on the emotional and the spiritual too. Those are the five stages. Okay, so you have a five leg table. Five, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Got that center one, just right <laughs> all grounded down into the earth. There you go. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's talk about stage three a little bit deeper. Mm-hmm. Because that's where I think most people are in a chronic automatic patterning, right? Exactly. So we know about our body's traumas that our cells regenerate every, you know, however many months to however many years. We are completely mm -hmm. cellularly like a new person. Every seven years, I think. Seven years, but like our our liver is like a few however many months and our lungs are however many months. And so in, in general, we're, we're in a constant state of completely regenerating who we are as human beings mm -hmm. on a physical cellular level. Right. However, what we know is that our genetics continually repattern the same traumas, whether they're physical traumas or emotional traumas that last in the body that are mm -hmm. like, you know, in you, right? Yeah. So what happens is, when at least when I start doing the somatic body work mm -hmm. is that the body no longer reproduces the scar tissue. Mm -hmm. the, you, you could actually see like somebody who has a 20 year old surgical scar, for instance, mm -hmm. that disappearing as we end up working on that in those, those areas. Mm -hmm. Right. So how do, how does, how does that 
translate to what we're talking about in stage three, yeah. where our, we're completely rejuvenating and regenerating, but we're creating the same automatic patterns. And then how do we, how do yeah. we technically get that to switch into stage four? Mm -hmm. yep. And then from stage four, the mindset that allows us to go into stage five, because yeah. I think that there's something emotional and then mental about going through those two places. So hundred percent. So to answer your first question, and I just want to answer before I forget there was the part two. So the first part of that is, you know, how we're regenerating, right? New cells and everything. But when we're fueling ourselves with the same thoughts over and over and over again, that's absolutely what's keeping us stuck because think about it it's the same thoughts that drive the same feelings the same emotion that drive more thoughts more feeling more emotion so we're creating these neural networks this these well uh group like grooves in your brain that are so we become so hardwired so it is so easy to keep going down that well-worn path taking us to nowhere We've, we've done it, you know, so often. And it's, there, there is a point, you know, in the beginning where we're ruminating, we're trying to make sense out of it, but then we have to prevent ourselves from marinating where we're just drowning in it. Right. And it's when you've gone down that road a hundred million times coming out no better than the last bunch of times, then it becomes, and this, this may annoy people, you're indulging, you're indulging in it. And there's that fine line where you have to say, I'm coming out of this no better than the last bunch of times. And now I have to be a little ruthless with myself. And I, I, I have to create a new neural network. So what you're at, what you actually need to do is break that connection and form a new one. And, and what happens is it's not like you forget your experience. It loses its emotional charge. So to your point, yes, your body's changing, but when the mind changes along with it, that's the that's that's what really moves the needle for us people in stage three they're with that same thought pattern that's keeping them with the same thoughts habits behaviors actions that are keeping them exactly where they are and really hurting their health in the process so that was your first question yeah right? <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm just gonna break up the, the second one so i know with like say tony robbins state mm -hmm. change right a 45 mm -hmm. second state change so do you have state changes, for instance, to, to move through those places? Yeah. You know, one of the things that, that when we work with people, you know, within the Institute, it's, it's knowing, first of all, they have to know uh, where, th where they are. Are they just, have they ruminated enough? And now it's, it's causing some harm. So when, when they know, and it's everybody's, you know, situation is a bit different, a bit different, but when they know then, okay, then it's time to come up with something new. So it could be something as simple as wearing a rubber band on their wrist, not, and so this way they would snap the rubber band, not to hurt them, to remind them. So when they find themselves going down that, that rabbit hole that they've done a million times, what they want to do is kind of snap the band, you know, and then beforehand, they also wanted to maybe envision a really happy, peaceful scene that feels better, right? And so that would be the time to implement it. So let's say they're triggered, they start going down that path. Wait a second, stop. And whether you have to scream it out loud, scream it in your head, whatever you have to do, because those thoughts are running away with you. Snap the band as that reminder, implement that peaceful, beautiful scene, generate the feelings that come with it, you know, and you'll phys physically, you'll feel different. You're creating a physiological change. Do that enough because you, you can't think of two things at once, right? So do that enough. And then the old track kind of loses its charge as the new track, you know, slowly takes over. That's right. just one of the things you can do. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when you were talking, I, I was remembering um, being in Israel and going down a cobblestone street that had groove marks in the mm -hmm. stone from the carriages that would mm -hmm. go through and how well grooved into history yeah. those grooves are from so many people. And what I find interesting is like, you know, those tracks are pretty thin, mm -hmm. yet everybody went in the same tracks. 
and nobody, you know, it's almost like no, nobody went outside of those tracks and said, hey, let's create some new grooves. Yeah. In the road, right. So let's just kind of go. I know I go often into. No, no, I got gotcha. you. Non- nonlinear places, but let's go into why do we continually follow the same groove that we know is not working? Because it, we don't have to think. Thinking is hard. So we don't have to think that way. We assume everyone knows better than us. We assume it's right and true, not because of we're tapping into our own inner guide. We're just assuming everybody knows better than us. So sometimes it's a self-esteem issue. Sometimes it's a you know a worthiness issue right here. But what happens is just because it's easy, just because it's familiar, doesn't mean it's good. The only benefit is that it's familiar, right? Like, and I use an example of, uh, let's say it's uh, there's snow on the ground, right? And someone, you know, p- paves a path for you. Very easy, right? You just keep walking on that thing and maybe it's taking you nowhere. But if you were to then shovel a new path, right? It could be rocky and unstable and you could slip and you could fall. But if you commit to going on that path, not allowing yourself to go on the other one, eventually that path is going to be uh, as well-worn as the first, but it's taking you somewhere so much better. But it's a commitment to stop walking on that first path and venture into the next one, knowing that it's not going to be easy. We don't like getting uncomfortable. Mm. We don't like that. We will do all we can to avoid discomfort. You know, But think of the caterpillar and the butterfly, the most classic example of transformation. Think about it. That caterpillar is just done being a caterpillar die, think about the symbolism, hangs itself from a branch to die to the life it's known, spins a cocoon around itself, is willing to be deconstructed, emulsified, unrecognizable from anything it once was, only because it went through that does it get to be the butterfly, most beautiful creature on our planet, right? Can't do that if it wasn't going through that process. And it has to fight to get out of the cocoon. It can't be helped out of the cocoon, right? Yeah. And I remember someone telling me also, if you were to go over uh, before it's ready and just get really close to that uh, cocoon, it would like shake a little as if to say, buzz off, I'm busy. And, you know, and it shows you transformation is a very personal process. People won't like it. They like knowing where you stood. They like knowing what they can get away with. They don't like it when all of a sudden you have something else to say. Right. So part of the grooves teaches me about the difference between leadership and following. And so we tend to follow our, our own grooves that mm-hmm. we've created. I know when I'm driving in the rain, mm-hmm. right? And I see the grooves of water that all the cars have gone through before. Yep. I always go outside of the grooves. Mm-hmm. It's a smoother ride, right? It actually is, is smoother than going inside of the grooves of other people because I'm not being controlled my steering wheel isn't getting locked into the grooves, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not being controlled by the grooves as much of mm-hmm. other people. So let's talk about what comes out on the other side of all that pain that transformation and struggle goes through. Yeah. And yeah, let's just, let's go to that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's such an amazing process when you realize just because that's what other people do doesn't mean it's right for me. And it's when you you say, okay, you know what, that may have worked for them, but this is my own path here. And I've, I'm, you know, when everything crashes and burns, I can, I can create whatever path I like. And I didn't even realize I needed to until this crash happened. And now I have that opportunity. So it is, it's a, it's such a beautiful uh, space to, to create something. When I say create something entirely new, I mean, I'm talking a new identity. You take everything you like about you and about whatever, and you leave behind everything that doesn't serve. So that transformation piece is the step-by-step process of facing your fears and slaying your dragons and dealing with these painful, uncomfortable emotions and deciding who you want to be at the end of it. You know, there's a version of you so healthy, so healed, so whole, so strong. And um, when we settle for the old, we never birth the new. Mm, I like that. So 
as I, as I listen to you, right? I, I think of what is the audience thinking? What is the mm-hmm. audience hearing? What are, what are they needing right now? And because I think, you know, we basically told people you're going to be really, really uncomfortable for a little while, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And what's going to come out on the end of that is, who knows, you get to create it. So let's talk about some modeling right yeah. for creation that doesn't include the comparison models that we're used to of i'm comparing what i want and what i'm going to build for myself in this new person mm-hmm. and we're not going to compare to madonna and to jay z and to oh, I, I, elon I, musk I, and to all those other oh. people we're going to we're going to build from scratch so how do we build from scratch when all we have are comparisons to go by? Yeah, it's a great question. I think when you, uh, co- comparison is just the death of your creativity. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing I would say is, and, and listen, I, I, I gave birth four times. It hurt, right? But look what you get at the end, right? So yes, we try to to avoid this discomfort you're not going through it for no reason and i tell everybody in the institute this is the hardest uh but the most rewarding work you'll ever do you're not doing this for no reason you're not doing this just because you want to punish yourself further you've been through the hardest part of it already this is the part you owe to yourself but to find out who you are at your physical mental emotional best at your personal professional best it's going to take some work uh, and, and that's why, you know, people who come into our community, they're like, they realize this is not just like a support group. No, no, no. You are here to get your job done, period. And that those are the only people I attract. Um, but to answer your question, you didn't go through this to model anybody. You did this to discover who you are meant to be the highest and best version of you. You know, what, what, if you, without your limiting beliefs, without your old habits, without your old rules, with all of that out of the way, who are you? Who are you? Right. That's what, that's what's left to discover. That's what's available to you. And, and to make that into an adventure rather than another chore. So here's, here's what I hear, you know, like from, if I'm looking at clients that I've had mm-hmm. patients in the past, right. Is holy shit, I already have a job. That's a whole other job. And that's going to take, that's even more important than the job that is making me money and sustaining me, Mm -hmm. finding time. So time, time and organization, time Mm -hmm. for the work, time for regular work, time for relaxation, recovery, rejuvenation, Mm self-care, all those things. So let's talk about that because- there's got to be balance here for for the audience, right? There's got to be yeah. a way to for them to go. Okay, I was overwhelmed, and now I'm calm. right. And here's the thing: your changes um, they're based on they're based on you. You know, do you want those changes to be slow and gradual? Do you want them to be drastic? It's completely up to you. As anything you do, every action, habit, behavior, thought you have takes you in only one of two directions: further or closer to the body, health, life, lifestyle, relationships you want. Which way are your actions taking you? So if you are the type that needs a slower, more gradual approach, beautiful, then just do that. It's it's the people who say, oh, that's just gonna be too much work, forget it. I mean, if, if the only reason we do something is because it's easy, what do you really expect? You know, think about anybody who's who's in really great shape, they're working at it. Anybody who has a great relationship, they're working at it. Anybody who's great at their job, they're working at it. There are plenty of people who are unwilling to put in the effort in that area. Okay, but then be okay with just okay. If you want something good, it's it's just gonna take the effort. And, and what I find too is a lot of people stuck in stage three, it's not that life is so bad. They figured it out. It's okay. You know, it's like, uh, they, they have, their partner comes home at the end of the day. Their kids aren't failing in school. They can button their pants. You know what I mean? And to them, it's like, but it's okay. Okay. But what about all that they could have if they were 
uh, just a little more willing to turn up the heat just a bit. Right. So that willingness that you're talking about mm-hmm. to me is part of the trauma and the pain, right? Mm-hmm. So how do how does one get past and beyond the two parameters, right? Of I am traumatized and I'm willing to be more traumatized on the way out Mm -hmm. so that I could get through. Yeah. But that's a personality that says, bring it on, right? So Mm -hmm. how do you develop that personality of bring it on, bring on the transformation, bring on that? You're not feeling that in the very beginning. Like I said, in the very beginning, getting out of bed may, may be all you can do. And that's plenty. And then, you, you know, you, you get a little bit stronger and a little bit stronger and a little bit stronger. You're not, you're not fresh out of your betrayal saying, okay, you know, let's take on the world. No, you're not. You, there's too much to process. Um, but willingness is, it, it's just, I love that word because with willingness, you will at whatever pace you're, you can handle mm-hmm. continuously move forward. And, and it's interesting too, because in the study, like I said, there were three groups who didn't heal. One group that did not heal was completely unwilling to accept their scenario. They just weren't having it. They were like the people, you know, standing at the lot where their house once stood. They're like, nope, I'm just going to kick and scream and mourn the loss of my house. They have every right to, but they didn't move. It's the ones who say, I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's got to be better than this. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so often you need a little extra incentive. And so, you know, if you have kids, it's a beautiful opportunity. They're watching you. If you don't do it for, for you, you do it for them. Like, you know, in my own instance, my kids, my kids saw me and I was like, I I wasn't going to burden them, but I wasn't going to hold, you know, like withhold the truth. They knew the truth. So they, they saw mom crash. They were going to see mom rise. And I said, it's, I have no idea what's going to show up here. I love you <laughs> and I'll do the best I can. <laughs> Give me a little bit of a pass. Um, and, and I didn't know what it was going to look like, but it's a willingness. Um, you don't have to be all ferocious about it, but just, just willing to mm-hmm. keep going. Right. But I like what you just said as well is cave. You gave the warning to the people around you too, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You said people around me, I have had this experience. And it yeah. may take me a little while. Let me go beyond that. What did you ask them to do for you, if anything? Yeah, you know, um, I guess, and maybe it was a unique scenario because my husband was actually the one who told my kids. Um, so, you know, I think on some level they were, it was like team mom <laughs> there for a while. Uh, but I, I just, I really, my only intention during that time, I really went from like kids, clients, you know, dogs, crash, kids, that was it. And, uh, and I, I just told them, I'm not working with a full deck here right now. I'll do the best I can, but don't ever think for a second, this has anything to do with you. Um, and I just, I, I kept talking to all of them. I mean, any, any parent will know your kids are so different. You can, like I have four kids, they couldn't be more different than one another. And they each needed me in their own way. Um, and I would try to be there as best I could in the way that they needed. But I was very honest, um, you know, letting them know I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not good today. I'm doing the best I can, but it has nothing to do with you. So for people who are going through betrayal as an acute, right? Mm -hmm. It's acute. It's not chronic. It hasn't been a long time. It's just really, this is. Yeah. Yeah. Give me like, Give the audience kind of your, I know you have the steps that Mm -hmm. what step one, I just got into this experience. Yeah. Do I share it with people? Do I stay and hide in myself? Do you know, like. These are the questions that come up. It's so common to protect the betrayer at our own expense. You know, because let's say they're well known, they're well liked, the whole family. I don't want to shake the, you know, shake things up. So we, we, you know, there's also so much shame. Here we are. We've just been put in a club we never wanted to be in. Right? We're so, we're so embarrassed. We're so ashamed. We didn't even do this, and we're ashamed, right? So, um, and then there's the the immediacy 
of of just life, the things that are happening. So it really depends on the person. They need a trusted other. And by, by that, I mean, whether that is um, the right type of support, uh, you know, a trusted friend, trusted family member. Um, and then they, the, you know, there are certain things that are more immediate than others. If they're in danger, they need to get out of danger. If they're not sure about any of their finances, they need to figure that out. So, you know, that's a priority. If, if it's just emotional support, that's a priority. Everyone is, is fresh out of their experience needing something, you know, one is different than the next. So it's meeting that initial need. But, but also what I find is they need to know uh, you're not crazy, you're not alone, and you can heal from all of it. Awesome. What is um, your suggestion for somebody who has gone through the transformation? Mm -hmm. They're they're at the end of stage five, mm -hmm. kind of, and they're looking off into the distance, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah, and anything is possible, mm -hmm. right? they can create their new tomorrow today. Mm -hmm. They can activate their vision for a better world. Let's talk about those steps because I think that those are the steps that sometimes get really lost within mm -hmm. the heaviness of those first three. Yeah, yeah. The, um, that is such a fun stage. We actually have a level of membership just for that type of that person who is at that stage. That's where the fun begins. That's where you create that new body, that new business. That's when you're ready for that new relationship. That's when you're ready for the, you know, all of those things. When you are carrying around like this 500 pound boulder of pain and you put it down, look what's available to you. That's when you strategically, you know, move towards what lights you up. And you, you may have had no clue what it was until you get to that stage five. But that's when, usually we see it in the community so often, that's when if someone is a coach, a healer, or a doctor, therapist, they want to become one of our certified coaches because they're so excited. It's like, they just want to pass it forward. But others, that's when they write the book. That's when they, they're committed to this new, um, you know, this new business idea that they thought were, was crazy, but now they have the confidence for it. That's when they're ready for that new relationship. They're ready to move, whatever it is. We never know uh, what's going to show up then, but when you're at that place, that's when you start planning for it. That's where it gets really exciting. Awesome. What, what do you say is like the biggest impact, not just the individual, but like, let's say your community, we take your community, your, mm -hmm. your institute, right? Uh -huh. And we extrapolate the impact from your institute, how many people you've seen and how many people they know and how many people they know and yada, yada, yeah. right? Let's extrapolate this into, so that people could get a sense of how powerful they are. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, you know, even when you just look at one person, take one mom, right? Here's this mom. She's been blindsided. Like, look at my own experience. I have four kids, right? So when you think about it, here's my experience through healing that impacts four kids who now have amazing coping skills because they've seen firsthand what healing looks like, right? Now think of the people that each of them know, their partners, you see? So, and that's just one, that's just me. So imagine how many, how many people between the, the people that you touch just throughout your day where, where, you know, they're like, what, you look good. Well, anything new? <laughs> You're like, yeah, just healed from the most traumatic thing ever. Right. Or, or um, how it affects the kids, how it affects, you know, a new partner or that same new improved partner. Right. It, it's, it's endless. The new businesses that are started because of it, the new it's, it, I can go on and on. Yeah. You know, I, I look at what is, what is it that I really want in this world? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I talk a lot about creating a new tomorrow. I talk a lot about health and science and fixing the systems that are, are kind of broken and, you know, how people can stop doing behaviors that not only harm themselves, but also mm -hmm. harm their community and their family and their people around them. Right. And I, I look at 
this one statement, you can't love anybody more than you love yourself. Mm -hmm. And I always have found like, felt like that is a false statement. Mm -hmm. I've always been able to love everyone else mm -hmm. more than I've loved myself. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's true about most everybody. And I think that that golden rule is a little bit switched as well. Like we don't want people to treat us the way we treat ourselves. We want them mm -hmm. to treat us the way others, <laughs> you know, treat us. So, yeah. so let's talk a little bit about that and how we get that internal self talk, how we get those things kind of dialed a little bit down so that we can really truly have that freedom. Yeah, I have a bit of a different perspective. And I guess I see so many, um, so many people coming into the Institute, they're chronic people pleasers. And what they're doing is they're giving love so that they get love in return. And that's not, that's, that's, it's not sustainable. It's not real. All it does is it's exhausting. But, but I do believe that we have to love ourselves first, because if you do, you have so much more to give. You're giving without trying. It's oozing out of you. It's a different energy. One is I'm going to give. So you give me back. It's a lack a scarcity. And the other is it's abundance and, and everything is energy. And we feel that. We feel that. So I feel like whatever, whatever work needs to be done mm -hmm. so that we're coming from that really full space. And, and it happens when you do this kind of work. It just does. Because you're like, you know, the version of me from years ago, I was so harsh and so critical and so judgmental. You know, now I'm like, I really like me. <laughs> we even have a new rule in the house. You know, I used to be so hard on myself. And then post-betrayal, I decided, you know what? When I do, let's say I always get lost wherever I go, you know, and I used to just criticize myself and whatever. Now, anything I do like that, I'm just adorable. <laughs> and everybody has to say this that I am. You know, it's like, and that's the thing. And what we're doing is we're, we're giving ourselves some grace, giving ourselves the love that we want. How much, how much better is it when you just give it to yourself? It just, you can't help but give it to others when you do that. Yeah, I always tell, tell people when I get lost, I, I'm not lost, I'm just adventurous. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, so yeah. So I appreciate you so much for coming on. Is there anything else you'd like to leave the audience with? Anything, you know, deep, dark, dirty, that they could do today, tomorrow, and start right now themselves to create that new tomorrow today? Yeah, I would say, I mean, find it really find out at, at, out of, I shared the stage, see where you are. And at the very least, get the trust again book, but at least, you know, or take the quiz, take the quiz to see to what extent you're struggling. They can just find that at the pbtinstitute.com forward slash quiz, but don't stay stuck. Don't stay stuck. Um, you, you owe it to yourself. You owe it to yourself to heal. And, and I, I, I promise you, you're going to be blown away by who you meet on the other side. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. It's been a great episode. I think we have a lot of good information, a lot of takeaways for the audience. And uh, just want to say thank you again so much for coming on and providing so much wisdom for the, for the audience. Thank this you so is, much. Uh, this is yeah, this has been another episode of Create a New Tomorrow. I'm your host, Ari Gronich. I love these conversations that get dark and dirty and deep and help you guys with, with tips and tricks to change your life and, uh, and your future and the future of our children. So anyway, thank you so much for being here and we are out. I'll see you next time.